Okay, so before we start, this year is going to be for the dedication of Rav Chaim Matzah. Thank you for all the support, of course, and thanks to the Rav for giving me the opportunity to do this year. So this year today is going to be somewhat tangential from what we've been discussing for the past two parts of the series for Tolai. Uh, we're going to talk about the kashrut of honey and royal jelly, and perhaps some other um, side discussions of other materials that come out of um, honeybees. So now. Um, without further ado, we'll continue. We're going to start talking about first of all the general knowledge of bees, what they are, and their physical characteristics. So, of course, we know that bees are winged insects that average in approximately one and a half millimeters in length. Light brown in color, composition is a golden brown band, segmented into seven parts. Number one is where they have a stinger. We know that they, they use in order to sting anything that tries to be seen as a predator against them. Um, they have what's known as a proboscis, which is their tongue which they use, as we're going to see, in order to take out the nectar, in order to produce the honey. Um, legs for moving around, antennas for detecting outside the environment. Um, they have three segments of the thorax, which is their upper part, and the six segments of the abdomen, which is the lower uh, half of the body, and the wings in order to propel themselves to move and fly around from place to place. This is just a general description. And let me just uh, mention to those who are watching online that all of the slides is going to be provided as well for the other two parts of the series. So it's going to be embedded into the video on YouTube. So just look at the underneath the link and it's going to be posted over there under Google Doc. So this is just going to be a general description about the various parts. We don't need to get into that. That's already described in the first part of the uh, slide. Now, there's three different types of bees. There's uh, three types of members of the hive. And they are known as the worker bee, the queen bee, and the drone bees. And these are very interesting because they have different, number one, they have different genders, but they also have very different functions of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis during their short period of lifetime. So three types of bees are as follows. We have what's known as the queen bee. The queen bee, she is essentially the queen of the entire hive, and her whole job, her sole duty, is to lay eggs and produce all other female population of the worker bees. All she does is essentially she's taken care of, all she needs to do is to lay eggs, and those lay eggs that are laid are going to produce an all-female colony of what is known as the worker bees. Now, the worker bees, as you can imagine, are their job is to work the hive in order to provide sustenance for the queen, and also eventually to build the honeycomb, and as well go outside as when they get old enough, to go out and take the nectar in order to produce, to produce honey. Now, when I say their lifespan, you have to understand that the vast majority of these, the, their average lifespan is 51 days. Okay, 51 days. Um, that's talking about if they're working throughout like the periods of like the summer, summer and um, and spring months. However, if they actually survive and they actually go through points in the winter, they tend to live up to six months. And the reason that's, that's different is because during the, pe the period of time in which they actually go outside, they're subject to many elements, they're subject to pesticides, they're subject to being like swatted or killed and uh, swallowed by other types of animals. Therefore, for the worker bees, they usually have a much shorter uh, lifespan. Now, the last population is the drone bees. Drone bees, um, what's shown on the right side. So, it's an all male population. Where do they come from? Because we said the queen bees lay the worker bees, so where do they come from? So the drone bees, they're laid by the worker bees. Okay? So queen lay for the worker, the workers, they, they lay for the drones. And the drones, they're an all-male population whose sole purpose is to mate with the queen bee or any other potential queen bee in another hive and to produce more worker bees. So it's an endless cycle. Basically, the queen bee makes worker bees, worker bees main drone bees, drone bees made with the queen bees to make more worker bees and drone bees and so on and so forth. It's an endless cycle which is why I've been having bees for time immemorial essentially. Now what I w just want to show you is if you actually look at the morphology of these three types of insects you see that the queen bee by and large is much larger than the others. Um, we're going to see that she also lives much much longer than the other bees and approximately 50 times longer. Right, so first of all you see it's larger. Um, Morphologically speaking, they have the ability to reproduce, um, sexual re reproduction, as opposed to the drone bees, which are not capable of doing that. They just lay eggs, but they cannot reproduce sexually. It's all asexual reproduction. Okay, now, so why this becomes important is because in order to describe whether honey and any other byproduct of bee is kosher, we have to understand that there's a Gemara, the Chorod, the Daf, Hey Amadal, which elaborates on the famous principle that states the following. Um, basically, essentially meaning that anything which leaves a tame animal, 
Any byproduct of it? So before we continue, just as a quick uh, mentioning, so please join us in the Shiva. We're here from S Sunday to Thursday evenings at 8 to 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday mornings from 9.30 to 1. Our website is yeshuaetzion.com. Please subscribe for all the on Instagram and YouTube and all other social media. And please donate and PayPal is also provided on the website. Thank you for the sponsorship and dedication. Now, going back to the Gemara. Gemara tells us again, anything that leaves from a Tamei animal, any byproduct of a Tamei animal, would have the status of Tamei animal and therefore it would be forbidden for consumption. Anything that comes from a Tahor animal, a kosher animal, would be Tahor as well because it has the status. So the Gemara brings a number of examples of how this would apply. Let's say you have a cow. We know cows are kosher, right? Generally cows are kosher, true? Yes. Okay, so now if a cow gives birth to an animal that looks like a donkey, it looks like a donkey. So now, I look at this donkey, and I'm like, wait a second, the mother was a cow, it's nursing from the cow, so I should assume that the mother is a cow, and the cow is tar. But is this animal that comes out of it, which looks like a donkey, is that forbidden or is it not? So the Gemara says, even if it looks like a donkey, and it sounds like a donkey, and looks like a donkey, it's not always a donkey. This thing is actually a cow, but it just doesn't seem to be so, for whatever reason may be, I have no idea, but... If that's the case, nonetheless, the principle tells us that anything that left from a tar animal is tar. Therefore, this animal is tar. Vice versa, if you have a donkey which gave birth to an animal that looks like a calf, right? And it sounds like a calf, it moves like a calf, it looks like a calf. Nonetheless, the Gemara says, even if that's the case, it's tummy like the, like the um, donkey itself, and therefore that would be forbidden. Another example the Gemara gives, it talks about the milk of kosher animals versus non-kosher animals. Right? So now, kosher animals, they produce milk would be kosher as well. Um, of course, there would be certain instances in which it would not be kosher. For instance, if the animal is found to be a trefa, in which case anything that comes out of that would be, would be prohibited. Now, vice versa, anything that comes out of a non-kosher animal, so if you have donkey milk or pig milk or things of that nature, um, they're at the uh, byproducts and anything else that comes out of it would be forbidden as well. And that would be an isur right It's not isur banan. It is an isur right to consume. Now, what is the chemistry of honey? How does honey made and whether it applies to the din of Hayatsemina Tameh Tameh? So now, the way bees make honey, there's a lot of diagram and chemicals that discussed over here. We're not going to talk about glucose and fructose and all those things. But just to describe what it was going on is as follows. The worker bees, which we said is the all female population, they go outside of the hive and they go into the flowers and they take the nectar from the flower. And basically, once it's inside of the bees, the, the saliva of the bees, they have enzymes in which it digests the nectar and it breaks it down from what's known as sucrose, which is what's called a disaccharide, meaning it's a large sugar molecule. It breaks it down into smaller um, sugar molecules and this process is repeated a number of times. Basically what happens is as the nectar is being broken down, the worker bees, they go to back to the hive and they spit out that digested whatever nectar and they bring it back into the mouth of another worker bee which digests it further which brings it back to another worker bee which digests it further and this pro pro uh, process could happen a number of times um, and eventually it's digested su sufficient enough for it to be completely regurgitated put into the hive which is going to be stored for a long period of time so what's clear to realize is that the um, production of honey is not a secretion of the bee it's not a secretion. It's a digestive process through the nectar, which eventually becomes honey. But it's not a secretion, so therefore it's not a derivative of the bee itself. It's just a byproduct through a digestive process, which happens through the nectar, which is outside of the bee. Okay? Bee vomit. All right. So essentially, it's bee vomit. Okay. So it's delicious bee vomit. It's very sweet bee vomit, but it is bee vomit nonetheless. Okay. Now, so the kashrut of honey. The Gemara tells us in Bechot's and uh, Zayin Amabet, which is only two that came after the first incident, it talks about. By Talks about very sponsored by Geffen. So it states that honey is kosher, but the reason for it being so is subject to Machok Tanin. There's two reasons, and the two reasons is going to be subject to a very interesting um, nafkamina that we're going to see at the end of this, at the end of these slides. But Tanakhanma tells us that the reason that it's kosher is because honey is not a byproduct of the bee, but rather it is the bee vomit, essentially. And it doesn't use those words, but that's what it would end up being. Um, that is the first opinion. However, Rabbi Kiva argues and says that no, really. The, the status of honey should have the status of any other secretion, and therefore it should be forbidden as well. And the only reason the Torah actually permits it is because there's a Xerat HaKatuv, which says, So basically the Pasuk says over there that the Torah only for, forbade 
Um, the Sheretz Ha'of, basically meaning any flying insect, but the secretion of a bee would not be under that category. And it's only dafka, the honey, that's, that's permitted. Anything else would be forbidden. We're going to see what exactly is enough in between these two of these and, and how this uh, plays. One of them I'm going to mention right now, um, between these approaches would be whether the honey of other insects would be permitted. For instance, wasp honey and ant honey, apparently that is also produced. According to the Tanakama, which says that since honey is made out of a non-secretion, therefore any type of honey would be permitted from other insects. According to Rabbi Akiva, since the, there's Xerath Kutub, which only permits bee honey, it would be dafka bee honey and not any other honey. So we're going to see how this is a pasuk in the Shulchan Aruch and some mafarshim on how they go about that uh, towards the end. As such, bee honey, according to all opinions, is kosher. According to all opinions, and is codified in Shulchan Aruch in Yerodea Pe'al Halacha Chet. See over there. Now, insects found in honey. If in a situation where insects are found in honey, which is very common, considering the fact that you can find ants that are there inside of there, or you can have the bee legs that are got trapped That's inside from, of it. That's from yesterday. Yeah, that picture was from yesterday. All right, so I figured it was very appropriate to bring it back. Right. So now, um, there's a uh, halacha that's brought down in Pedada and Yud Gimel, which says the following Dvash in the flow of if you have honey in which there was fallen ants inside. So then Malan says that a person is allowed to heat it up to the extent in which it's going to disintegrate and dissolve inside of there. And afterwards, a person can filter out whatever remains. So now, we spoke about yesterday this whole concept of a person is not allowed to be mevatel isul right? So when he hits up the, the thing, the, the honey, it becomes liquidy. Yeah. And when it becomes liquid, then you could filter it, and therefore the honey will go down and the animal or whatever it is, the, the thing would stay on top. Right. That's what I mean. Not that you're going to cook it inside, but just allow me to separate it right. through the process of heating. Right. Okay, so now, th if that's the case, the question becomes, how come that's not a problem of Mibat al which we said that, you know, you're know you not allowed to do that. I mean, clearly there is some you know, aspect of taste that's going inside of it, and maybe it's going to be Mibat by you know, having it dissolve. So, literally all the Mepharshim jump on this and they said there's no issue whatsoever because the person's intention is not to clear is, is to clean out the honey but not to perform the beetle meaning if my whole intention was to crush the honey the crush the insect inside that's not permitted however if my intention is to clear it out and therefore I'm doing some mechanical process through which that's possible that's not part of the issue as we spoke about yesterday as well see there um, other halakha aspects of honey so just to list five things that came up um, not subject to Bishul Akum since it could be consumed raw regarding the laws of Bishul Akum Shulchan Aruch says that there's two things that's necessary, it has needs two conditions. Number one, it has to be found on what's called Shulchan al meaning it has to be found on the state dinner, uh, or, the, or the, on the king's feast. And the second thing, it cannot be consumed raw. Now, since honey is able to be consumed raw, we find in the Rambam, it's found throughout the Gemara, found in the Shulchan as well, that says that it is not subject to Bishul Akum. Number two, it is one of the seven liquids which are called the Makhshurei Ochlim, which basically means the Gemara in I'm sorry, the Mishnah Makhshirin tells us that there are seven liquids in which, when it comes to the contact with food, it makes the food susceptible to Tumah. Prior to which, if there is no contact, the food can never be Makabal Tumah in any uh, scenario. So now, one of the seven liquids is Dvash. Now, Dvash, the, the Mishnah says, that, and for all the comment, commentaries of the Mishnah, it's not referring to date honey. In this case, it's referring to bee honey. So, if a person were to dip something into the honey, you know, therefore it would be like Makhshirin for, for Tumah. A person would have to wash his hands beforehand before he actually consumes it. Um, number three is brought, brought down in the Orachayim. It says that Baruch of honey is shahakol. Um, some want to question why is that the case. I mean, if honey comes from nectar and nectar comes from the ground, because right, it's from the flowers, shouldn't it be hadama. Clearly that should not be the case because it has obviously a very different look to what it no longer has the form of the nectar, but rather it comes as a dis dissolved part, you know, from the saliva. It has a different status, therefore it has, is Baruch shahakol. It's not going to say gidol, gidol karka. And the Bracha Ochanafer would be Baruch Hashat. Many Jews, especially of Ashkenazic origin, have the custom of dipping, dipping a, um, the apple in honey during Rosh Hashanah as a symbol of having a sweet ear. And that's brought by, down by the Ramah in Hachor Rosh Hashanah. And finally, some honey is adultery with corn syrup. It would pose an issue for those who do not consume Kitriyot during Passover. So, that being the case, a Pesach Hachar would be required in such a case. This would not pose an issue throughout the year because there's no other um, issues that come along for Kitriyot during the year. Um, regarding having a company which has 100% honey, which we know is unadulterated with any other types of flavors, uh, actually would not be required because this is clearly a kosher product. Now, as a side discussion, we're going to talk about what royal jelly is. It's actually something interesting because that's became a very popular thing, especially amongst the uh, recent years. 
Cause of royal jelly, what royal jelly is? Royal jelly is a glandular secretion. Again, that's, I'm bolding this, I, I, I should probably like put it as caps because this is going to be a clear distinction between what honey is and royal jelly. Royal jelly is basically a secretion that comes from the upper mouth, right, of the, uh, the upper part of the mouth of the, of the bee, uh, from the worker bees, and when the, whatever they secrete, its purpose is to use as a, it's a nutritious, thick, milky substance used to provide nourishment for the queen bee and all developing larvae for the first three days of their life. The reason it's called royal jelly is because it's only the queen that has it. So we saw that the queen bee, right, it was much larger and lived much longer than the rest of the bees. It's not only because of the fact that it stays inside of the hive, right, but because since it has royal jelly, that royal jelly provides it with a lot of more, much more nourishment and allows the queen bee to live for up to seven years as opposed to only 50 days for the other worker and drone bees. Seven years, that's a very long time. And it's assumed to be because of the royal jelly that's consumed. Um, another thing that's capable of doing is it changes completely the morphology of the queen bee, which makes it susceptible to laying up to 2,000 eggs per day. Yes, 2,000 eggs per day. I saw a server that said 12,000. Um, that seemed to be maybe perhaps a type of shame say you should, you should not have said that's only 2,000. Um, now, so now, some have claimed that because it has numerous benefits for the queen bee, perhaps it has many benefits as well for human beings, and therefore it became a big thing for people to assume that it should have also many health benefits, curing or treating at least type 2 diabetes, use anti-inflammatories, the list goes on, on um, having like health benefits for people dieting, burning fats and things of the sort. Uh, there's a many... Fertility, people use it for, for fertility. There's many things that go on. on. Um, I tried to read a number of articles on this on PubMed regarding this. Um, it says there's pretty much there's not enough uh, data that could actually support such claims. Um, so before anything could be said conclusively, more research is needed before such statements. But that, that's not really the point of our discussion today. That's a side comment. Um, now, kosher royal jelly. As noted above, anything which lives in non-kosher animal is non-kosher as well. As noted above as well, these, uh, there are two conflicting reasons that the Gemara allows honey to, co to be consumed. The first conflicting reason we said was according to the Tanakama was that honey is not a secretion. If honey was a secretion, it would be usr. Okay, if it was a secretion, it would be usr. According to the second reason, the Torah permits anything that comes out of a honey. Okay, so now nafkamina would be, according to the first reason, royal jelly would not be permitted because it is a secretion. According to the second reason, anything that is a secretion would be permitted and therefore royal jelly should be, should be allowed. Now, uh, halakha debate, so this is obviously subject to contemporary makhluk poskim, there are those who permit the royal jelly, right, that would be based on the second reason, and it's, and they would permit it, it's, it's not that they permit it all, all across the board, some are more makhluk than others, but most of them agree that it's only in situations where, where it's uh, like a health necessity, as we said, that there are those who actually believe that's a health benefit. So, um, those who allow is the Tzitz Eliezer, Rabbi Moshe Shtarbuch, and the Shilat Vahana HaGod, and also the Akut Osev, quoting Haram Avadia, says that it is permitted at the very least, or perhaps even very most, when there's a situation for any medical need, however minor. It goes to the extent that even if a person has like a, feels a little weak, person, if, if there is some conclusiveness about the fact that it's a considered health benefit, they would allow the help the, this royal jelly. Those who forbid it take the latter approach and say, no, it's only things that are not secretions that are permitted, but only you know things like honey, which is not a secretion that is permitted. So. Um, the Michal Shlomo famously quotes this idea that, you know, if the, the, the Torah did not permit anything besides honey because it's not a secretion. So since royal jelly comes from the body of the bee itself, that would be uh, forbidden. And Daf Kuvmentet says that this is considered a problematic problem as well. Halak consensus amongst all American Hashkachot is to be stringent and forbid its consumption. They do not allow it and they don't give Hashkacha for this whatsoever. Um, there is an interesting thing that's brought down in the Shulchan Aruch, and this is, this is where it gets a little fascinating. The, the, we spoke about um, this, this idea whether the honey of other insects are permitted, right? from honey from wasps, and whether it has the same status of honey for bees. So now, what is it based on? It, it's based on what we said earlier, and let's see if I can find that machloket over here, the reason that honey for bees is, is permitted. So now, according to the first reason, okay, we said that the reason that honey um, the honey from, from bees is permitted because it's considered to be a non-byproduct, okay? So now, if it's not a byproduct of the bee, but rather it's, it's just come from the nectar, therefore any other type of thing would be permitted as well. So that would basically mean that the, um, that the consumption of 
honey from wasps is permitted as well. Now, the honey from wasps is permitted as well. Therefore, what would that mean for the royal jelly? Seemingly, it's only because it's not a secretion that it's permitted. Right? So therefore, if it's true that the honey of wasps is permitted, therefore it would not be true that the royal jelly is permitted. However, conversely, if it's not true, or if it's true that the honey of wasps is forbidden, therefore royal jelly would be permitted because it would be based on the second reason, which is that anything come from the bee is permitted. If you look at the Shulchan Aruch, he actually says, Stam Halacha, that the honey of wasps is permitted. Yesh Osrim, and there are those who forbid it. The Ramah says it's forbidden completely. However, according to Maran's Pesach, if he holds that the honey of wasps is permitted, that's the Stam Halacha, it would be that according to Maran, the, um, the royal, jelly. royal jelly would be forbidden. It would be forbidden based on that. That would be, and if you actually look at the, at the commentaries, the, the Kafa Chaim actually says that Milan is being machmer because when he ever, whenever he says a yesh omer, which is more machmer, we, he, we tend to go with that more machmer approach. That's not agreed upon all. We do assume, at least according to Shachar Ruch, that the honey of wasps is permitted because it's not a secretory substance, and therefore that would forbid royal jelly, even according to Shachar Ruch. That seems to be um, the, pretty much the major opinion amongst all poskim. And essentially, this talks about royal jelly, and, um, and honey, but when it comes to like, things like beeswax and like, um, like the ve venom that apparently is also considered um, to be somewhat of an anti-inflammatory uh, property. Populous. Right, populous as well. So now, beeswax, according to all, is permitted because it's not even considered to be a food. It has like no taste, it's not considered a food substance, therefore it would be considered like kosher, but not be non-kosher. Um, most other derivatives of the bee itself would be considered fine as well because of the fact that it's not considered. To be food substance. When it comes to venom, however, there is somewhat of a debate. Some say it's permitted, some say it's forbidden because it's considered a complete secretion. And with this, we finish and we'll continue tomorrow.